I'm Jim Lutis. I am the executive director of the Pell Center and the vice president for strategic initiatives here at Southern Virginia University. It's lovely to see all of you in person uh, for what is our final public event of the academic year. Uh, it's been a heck of a year. Uh, we started out doors on the lawn in the back uh, in September uh, for our first event in partnership with the League of Women Voters. Uh, we're ending now with our third event with the League of Women Voters. Uh, and I want to take a moment just to really thank them for a great partnership. Uh, this series will continue uh, into the summer months and beyond. Uh, and so I hope that if you're not on our email list, you get on our email list. You go to PellCenter.org and sign up uh, and make sure that you catch uh, all of the events that we've got coming. Um, next year, you may have seen uh, a flash up on the screen that uh, it's the 75th anniversary of Salve Regina University and the 25th anniversary uh, of the Pell Center. Um, a nice certain symmetry there. Uh, we've got some uh, exciting things in the works. Uh, we're not going to announce them tonight, but they're coming. Uh, and we hope that you will uh, certainly take advantage and be a part of those really momentous uh, occasions uh, to think about the work of the university, the Sisters of Mercy, uh, and the Pell Center. Um, uh, tonight, uh, before we really get started, I, I really want to take a moment and thank the people that make these events happen every time. Uh, my colleague Teresa Haas, Aaron Barry, the folks from IT, uh, they make these events succeed uh, in multiple ways. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to them publicly uh, for a great year of programming. And please join me in a little sign of thanks. So I mentioned that um, uh, we, this is the third in a series of events with the League of Women Voters. Jill Cassis, you and your team have been absolutely fantastic partners uh, in putting this series together. And I want to thank you for your leadership and your friendship in all of this. Um, we're met tonight uh, to hear from a speaker who I suspect needs not much introduction with this audience. Uh, but Colin Woodard is uh, uh, an award-winning journalist with the Portland Press Herald. Uh, prior to that, he reported from literally all over the world uh, for the Christian Science Monitor, the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education. A lot of chronicles there. Um, he's uh, he's he's uh, well known nationally, in addition for his great journalism, for his for his work as a historian. Uh, his books. Uh, uh, American Nations, plural, uh, and most recently Union, uh, are really phenomenal pieces of work. Uh, I discovered Colin uh, when we had him on Story in the Public Square last fall, uh, and after about 10 minutes of chatting with him on the, on the pre-interview, I said, Colin, what, 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 what are you doing with the, these important insights that you've gleaned in all this research? And that conversation led to uh, are asking Colin to join the Pell Center as a senior adjunct fellow. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about what that project is going to be tonight. Uh, but you didn't come to hear from me, you came to hear from Colin Woodard. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Colin Woodard. Thank you, sure. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me uh, okay through this mic? Excellent. Well, thank you to the Pell Center and to Salve Regina University for having me and for all of you for having uh, come tonight. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about how I came to write my most recent book, you see up on the screen, Union, and some of the key ideas within that book. Ideas which are unfortunately extremely relevant to today's events. Now my previous book, American Nations, which Jim mentioned, argued that there's never been one America, but rather several Americas, and that there are 11 today most of them tracing their way back to one of the rival colonial clusters that formed on the eastern and southeastern rims of what's now the United States. Those projects had different uh, and distinct religious, ethnographic, and uh, religious and political characteristics, different ideas about who they were, what they celebrated, what constituted the good life, what sort of society they should be building, where they were going. In other words, all of the things and components of what anthropologists think of as culture. These projects 
you know, the Puritan-founded uh, New England, the Dutch settled area around what's now New York City, the uh, Chesapeake country's uh, settlement was led by the second, third, fourth sons of uh, English country gentry trying to reproduce the, uh, you know, Downton Abbey, you know, uh, sort of manorial society, the English countryside, the Scots-Irish backcountry, the Spanish settled southwest, and so on, uh, all were very distinct from one another. They were separate countries and separate worlds. They were rivals and often even enemies. Sometimes they were belonging to different empires, as in the case of the French or the Dutch, but even the British ones allied on opposing sides of major conflicts of the era, like the English Civil War of the 1640s or the Glorious Revolution of 1688 or 1689 by the time word got over here. Their own intercolonial conflicts, right? Maryland uh, you know, being invaded by Virginia and so on and so forth. They wound up together in an accident of history. Uh, a shared resistance to defend their own local idiosyncratic ways of governing themselves from a change in British colonial policy, a change which demanded conformity among the colonies of the sort that uh, absolutist kings like, uh, uh, like uh, those in France had already been enjoying. And so in that shared resistance, they created an ad hoc joint military command in the form of the Continental Army. They created a treaty organization to try to coordinate and back up that army in the form of the Continental Congress, which had to move around uh, the map as the fronts extended and changed during the revolutionary conflict. And lo and behold, they won, and they found themselves inside something called the United States, except nobody was quite sure what that meant. In other words, the United States of America came into being as a contractual agreement, a means to an end for the parties involved. Nobody at the time thought that they had just created a nation state in the sense that Holland or Prussia or post-revolutionary France were, or that the German romantic thinkers hoped that all the many hundreds of thousands of little principalities and city-states of the German Confederation might one day become. Its people lacked any shared history or religion or ethnicity. They didn't speak a unique language all their own. They hadn't occupied the continent long enough to have some kind of sense of dwelling in some mythic homeland since time immemorial, and they'd killed or pushed out, often in living memory, the very people who could make such a claim. They lacked a shared political heritage apart from the imperial ties that they had just rebelled against, and they had no shared story of who they were and what their purpose was. In short, they had none of the foundations of a nation state. They had no story to bring and hold them together. Uh, here, by the way, is what they look like today if you map them out on a county level scale. You may have seen this map floating around the internet. So I wondered after writing that book, well, how and when did that change? Because clearly it did. At some point, these differences were papered over by a story that successfully convinced us as a people, convinced us to think that we had a shared origin story, a shared past, a common culture, a shared sense of purpose and definition of who belonged and why. In other words, a national narrative. And I wondered, who created this story and when? And why? And how on earth did they disseminate it? Because I knew that as late as the 1860s and 1870s, people still thought of the country as separate regional cultures locked in a federation together. Who managed to convince people otherwise? And what lessons does that um, unbelievable undertaking have for us today when the federation, again, stands in jeopardy? Now, such stories, national narratives, come along now, yes. Such stories are required of every nation, be it Germany or France or Japan or China or ourselves. Because as individuals, to have fealty to something as abstract as a nation, to feel that we owe it greater loyalty than to others, and that we're bound to its fellow members more than we're bound to people who aren't members of the nation, that we might ultimately give our lives to it, that requires a truly compelling and credible story, one that's evocative and feels true on some level, that has footings in the past and gives us an answer as to why it is we're together. Now, intellectuals from Jill Lepore to Michael Lind to David Brooks and Ross Douthat have all pointed recently to the need for a new and renewed US national story, or possibly a revamped one, so as to provide the communal identity that incorporates an understanding of our national origins, purposes, and possible future. 
People need such a story. And as Lepore once put it, they can get it from scholars or they can get it from demagogues, but get it, they will. A society without a credible story, the historian William McNeil wrote 35 years ago, soon finds itself in deep trouble. For in the absence of believable myths, coherent public action becomes very difficult to improvise or to maintain. So think about it. Ideas are among the most powerful forces in human society, and national narratives are among the most consequential of all ideas. But even as they're powerful, they're abstractions, right? In writing Union, I was really interested in seeing how something can possibly go from an idea in somebody's head to get out into the zeitgeist, into the shared consciousness, and thus reshape the world. So I wanted to write this story biographically, through the lives and actions of the people who actually came up with and fought with one another over these most consequential of ideas, to understand their families, their childhoods, their friends and mentors, their enemies, their experiences, good and bad, that shaped their ideas and their ability and you know, advantages in order to be given a stage to spread them out into the world and allow them to take root. And so Union reads something like a novel. It's shared storylines of the five key figures, parallel narratives that eventually collide into one another. And I found this not only is it a, you know, if you're gonna write essentially a intellectual historiography, it's more compelling reading that way, but more importantly, it's a much more uh, incisive and useful way to actually research the topic. You would never understand how these people came to the ideas they did unless you followed their lives as they happen and as they encountered the different concepts that would later come out in their writings and thinkings, as they clashed with each other, as they responded in real time and their ideas evolved and their abilities, the gatekeepers who let them through, the compromises that might be made. It's the only way that you can actually understand what happened. To have done it in an omniscient stand back and survey it way would have caused you not to ask all of the right questions. Now I thought when I started that I would be writing a story that started in the 1870s after the collapse of Reconstruction and the you know, conclusion of the Civil War period. A time when, you know, after a conflict that had killed over 600,000 Americans, obviously there would have been a great incentive to find a way to have North and South be able to come up with a shared story they could agree on to move forward as a people. That must have been it, right? Well, yeah, that all happened. But what surprised me when I started researching it is the beginnings of the story and the beginnings of the fight started much earlier in the 1830s of all time periods, oddly enough. Um, and that was, the reason for that is that in the 1830s was the time that the ad hoc story that had been holding the early republic together was no longer holding the early republic together. That ad hoc story had been that, well, what holds us together as Americans is we fought the British in the American Revolution, we won. You know, glory to be to us. You know, how amazing that that possibly could have happened. And that was a, powerful and compelling story, except by the 1830s, the generation that had fought the American Revolution was passing from the scene. It was no longer part of a living memory and therefore doesn't have the same amount of emotional impact, right? The disappearance of the generation who fought World War II and the Holocaust, that disappearance from the stage is starting to transform the Overton window in our own society. Young people today, undergraduates, weren't alive for 9-11. It's history to them. The visceral impact of what that meant to those of us who remembered the world before and after that is different than someone who just learns about it afterwards. Same stuff was evolving about the American Revolution itself. It didn't have the same dynamic um, power and gravitational pull that it had for the generation who had fought it. And that was a, you know, a struggle you know, with uh, George Washington as a deity and you know, Henry Knox and uh, his pantheon up on Mount Olympus, Hamilton and Lafayette and all that. And they were you know, models of Republican virtue, and, and isn't that fantastic? This is all from the Capitol Rotunda in, uh, in Washington, DC. There were also signs that the country was starting to split apart. By this time, there had been secessionist movements in greater Appalachia in the 1790s with the Whiskey Rebellion, big chunks of it trying to break off and form their own separate nation states. And also New England during the War of 1812, terribly unpopular New England, Mr. Madison's War. A bunch of New England's leaders had gathered over in Hartford to consider seceding from the Union and forming their own Northern Confederation, perhaps uh, allied with the British. By the 1830s, there were growing tensions over the institution of slavery. 
at odds as it was to those fundamental values in our opening statement as a people, the Declaration of Independence, with those ideals about the innate equality of humans and their inalienable right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and representative self-government, all things that were the antithesis in slavery. Right? The Founding Fathers assumed that slavery was an anachronism, a mild embarrassment, that give it time will just die away on its own. That's why they kind of wrote in that, you know, the slave trade will end on a certain date in 1808 and things will carry on. By the 1830s, it was clear that none of that was true, that in fact, slavery was gaining economic and social strength, and that across the South, there was actually movements who were articulating slavery not as an embarrassment, but as a moral good upon which a republic must stand, like in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Those fissures, that tension between the fundamental values in the Declaration and the emergence that slavery was there to stay and growing was also causing fissures uh, within the republic that followed on regional lines. In short, at that point in the 1830s, it was becoming clear to many people that not having a national story to hold the Federation together was becoming a national security threat. That narrative of why everyone was together was needed, or it was clear that the various regional cultures were to drift apart. And it turned out that there wasn't just one story that emerged in the 1830s, there were two in competition. A battle over the soul of the nation that unfortunately continues to this very day. And the story goes like this in brief. It started the first person to like try to actually be, uh, have the uh, ostentation to try to package a national story and promote it out to an entire people was this man, George Bancroft. Largely forgotten today, but that would surprise people in the 19th century because he was bar none the most famous and influential historian of the 19th century, probably one of the most influential American intellectuals of that entire period. And he lived through the entire 19th century, right? He was born in 1800, he didn't die until the early 1890s. That was the kind of span he had. And he ended up sitting down and doing that because he had a very peculiar background. Um, he was a New Englander, and a lot of his ideas emerged out of greater New England culture. He was the son of a uh, leading congregational intellectual, and uh, he had attended in a very New England fashion, Phillips Exeter, and then on to Harvard, which he graduated from in 1817 at the age of 17. And he was a promising student. So the president of Harvard at the time, President Kirkland, tapped him and a number of other promising students like Edward Everett and others from that class to go out and be the shock troops to a project, an intellectual project he had to transform American higher education and academic life. His theory, President Kirkland's theory was this, you know, that right now Harvard is pretty much in William and Mary and all the other higher edu education institutions in the US were still more or less glorified boarding schools, places you sent your tween boys to go and have a vigorous schedule so they wouldn't get in trouble. And then if you're lucky, maybe they'll go on and join the, become congregational preachers, but at least they hadn't gotten in trouble during all that period. He knew, though, that there was a new um, way of thinking and knowledge happening on the continent, especially in Germany, a, a movement of um, rational, evidence-based, scientific inquiry, where you would actually not look just back to the classical texts for the known knowledge of the universe and memorize it, but that you would actually go and experiment and try to discover knowledge itself. That the Germans were doing things like actually analyzing the Bible as a historical document and studying it. Crazy for Puritans, but it was a whole new and revolutionary idea, and it was taking place at these universities in Germany. And his idea was, well, we need to have that rational, evidence-based, you know, what we would consider now a research university, we need to have that here in America, but we have no people trained in it. There's no way to get a doctorate, right? There's no doctoral granting institutions. They're all in Germany. So he took Bancroft and a bunch of other young men and sent them, all scholarship paid, in 1818 to Germany to study, and that's what Bancroft did. He was sent as a young man traveling across the bumpy roads of Germany to Göttingen and then to Berlin, where he studied literally under the people who were devising uh, Central European ideas of what a nation should be in the German Confederation after the end of the Napoleonic War. His professors were Herring and Humboldt and Hegel and, you know, and all of the rest, right? He, uh, he studied under these people and gained their ideas their ideas, German ideas about historicism, that history has a plan. Ideas that people, the Germans, we may be all these hundreds of nations, little nations and principalities and free city states and archduchies, but we are all German. There's something that links us together, that there are 
they are many seeds, but they're all from the same organism, and that they will grow out from the, the seeds encoding, that, that societies are like plants, and that they will, they will follow these instructions, have these certain characteristics. All these ideas Bancroft was picking up from his professors. But they were also asking him questions, because everyone was intrigued by this young, strange American republic. They would pepper him with questions that demanded that he answer them as not a Massachusettsian, but as an American. How strange, I'm being asked to answer for this whole country. So he had to start thinking about those things, respond to those things. And his professors gave him letters of introduction to all of the high intellectual society in Europe at the time. So as he traveled around Europe during his time off and then after his studies, he had letters of introduction that led him to hang out at dinner parties with the Marquis de Lafayette walking through the English countryside with Washington Irving and Gallatin, going and seeing Descartes' bones in Paris at the Institut de Francais when they first arrived. He walked out and hiked out to Goethe's cottage in Germany and like spent two weeks hanging out with him. Hated the guy, actually. He went all the way to you know, backpacking you know, Italy and dancing with you know, Napoleon's niece and archdukes of this and that. When he's finally making his way back to catch the boat home to Boston, he's in some port in northern Italy. And what should be there? Old Ironsides, the USS Constitution, same vessel up there at the Charleston Navy Yard, is there on a port call for the US Navy. And the captain's inviting people out, so he went out and joined him, is on the deck, and who should get on the next boat, climbing out the deck to visit? But, of course, Lord Byron and his mistress, who invite him over to their villa, where he hangs out drinking wine. So he finally comes back in the 1820s, after several years abroad, plugged into and invited into an international society of letters, perhaps the first American who had, had done to them, and also with his head full of these ideas of nation and nationhood. He then attempted to do a variety of pursuits, be a preacher, be a poet, uh, run a boarding school in Northampton. He was terrible at all of them. And then he finally sat down at what ended up being his true calling, which was to write a story of his country and its people. And he did this through the form of a gigantic collection of histories, not history of Massachusetts or South Carolina, as had been the case before, but a history of the United States of America, a history that would tell the story not of the United States starting in 1776, but beginning back in the early 1600s, a story that would take him 10 volumes to complete and 60 years. He would spend his whole life completing volume after volume, and all of those volumes only got him up to the Constitutional Convention in 1789. In fact, history was moving faster ahead than he was catching up to it. But think about it. It was a prehistory of the United States that was to establish that, in fact, we are one peoples, right? And he was taking his Puritan heritage, right? The New England idea that we are an you know, Old Testament people like the Hebrews who have been charged by God to reform the world, put a light on a hill, go out and create a more perfect society as per Calvin in these books, and we're going to go do it collectively, and we'll be punished if we don't. That combined with very secular ideas of German historicism, the idea that history has a guiding presence, ideas that the old ancient Teutons and the black forest of Germany created the first you know, natural rights democracy, and that that baton had been passed by the Saxons who invaded England, and then they'd carry the baton when the England could carry it no further to the Americas, and that he created this national narrative, a civic national narrative you may recognize portions of that basically said, America has been charged by God and providence to, to carry the baton of freedom across the world and across this grand continent. That, that we have been chosen to do that and that that is our guiding purpose following the ideals set forth by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence and that God was involved when the founders were writing it, that he came down and intervened and, and was actually, you know, the divinely inspired documents. That America is an exceptional place, right? With some, you know, the, the rules of history don't quite apply to us. We exist above and beyond it. That we have a manifest destiny. He didn't use those words, but a famous reviewer of his books who loved them did. Enormously influential. The books caused an earthquake when they came out at a time when the spoken word and books were the media and the way things went. Transformed the way people talked about politics, about what the United States was and what its destiny should be all at once. Um, and so that was a very dramatic undertaking. But it would have a counter reaction very, very quickly. Because that was not ideas that were, that were widely shared, that Jefferson's notions in the Declaration were the correct ones. One note, he didn't just sit in his ivory tower while writing these books. He was also actively involved in the events of the day. 
He was the Democratic Party boss, party boss of Massachusetts when it was Federalist. He was kind of the minority party boss, but ran for governor. Didn't succeed, but when Polk became president, he was elevated to be Secretary of the Navy. It is he who created the Naval Academy in Annapolis, modeled on his experiences trying to run a boarding school. It was he who, as Secretary of the Navy, gave the orders that led to the Naval Detachments doing the conquest of California. It was he who, as Acting Secretary of War, gave the orders that caused the United States to make the military movements which caused the annexation of Texas. He later served as our ambassador in the United Kingdom and then uh, after, uh, uh, sometime later after the Civil War as our ambassador in Germany where he was best friends with Bismarck and riding around the Tiergarten with him. But his ideas during his lifetime, in fact from the beginning when he first put them out, were rapidly contested by a group of Southern intellectuals centered around this man, William Gilmore Sims. A man also forgotten, maybe even more so than Bancroft. Oh, Bancroft, by the way, spent all of his summers where? In Newport, the original owner of Rosecliff. The Rosecliff property was for the roses he developed. The American Beauty Rose in his spare time was his project. And he rode horses around here. He transported them uh, back and forth from New York or Washington, depending on where he was living at the time. The original Rosecliff was a rambling wooden estate. It was then, you know, after Bancroft sold it, mulled down and they built, you know, whatever that is, the Petit Trianon or something over there. But it was originally a modest, you know, 50 room wooden household. But yeah. Bancroft was here writing some of his books uh, just down the cliff walk. William Gilmore Sims was not, but he, uh, he's forgotten today, but that would also surprise people in the 19th century because he was one of the most popular, by some uh, estimates, the most successful author of the antebellum United States. He was the author of novels and histories, and he was bar none the leading intellectual light of the antebellum South and later the Confederacy. He started literary journals. He ran in the state legislature. He was uh, uh, the, the chief uh, you know, counselor and advisor to South Carolina governors and senators. He was also a man of his region. He grew up in Charleston. And he looked upon the ideals and the uh, ideas that Bancroft had put forward from the Declaration as total heresy, that clearly they were all completely wrong, he said. Jefferson. He and his fellow um, Southern intellectuals argued was wrong the Declaration. Humans are unequal. And in fact, only one group of humans is capable of achieving the self-government argued in the Declaration, the allegedly superior Anglo-Saxon race of which I happen to be a member. And he uh, argued that forward that in fact, the United States is a collection of organic ethno-states, each an Anglo-Saxon homeland, that that baton that had been passed was an exclusive baton across the Atlantic, and that the genius of the United States, which he supported during the uh, nullification crisis, was that it was an umbrella protecting these Anglo-Saxon homelands and collective security arrangement like NATO or something like that, and that society was best organized in this fashion, that we already knew this by looking back on the record of previous democracies of ancient Greece and Rome, which were Slave states, right, where a small minority of people had the privilege or the liberty of practicing democracy and subjugation and slavery with the natural lot of the many. That this was the only way that a republic could function. It was a classical republicanism. And he argued this forth in his books and his newspapers and such. And that clash between those visions that took place, of course, fomented and drove the events of the 1840s and the 1850s and on into the Civil War itself. And has been a major push and pull in the identity of the country since the very beginning. The pivotal figure, though, in this story was this man who has not been forgotten, fortunately, uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, for those who don't know, he was, you know, was a, uh, born into slavery in the eastern shore of Maryland. He managed to teach himself covertly to read and write and uh, engineered an escape while he was uh, a, uh, kept as a house slave in Baltimore to escape uh, to the north as a young man using the most advanced technology of the day. It would be like escaping on the you know, SpaceX rocket today. He managed that the first scheduled passenger service was between Baltimore and, and working your way towards uh, Philadelphia on the Wilmington line. And it was closely guarded to make sure that nobody, uh, enslaved people were able to escape on that, loop, on that route. So there were people checking all the time. And he managed to work out a scheme where he uh, borrowed a uh, sailor's uniform from a free black sailor and his federal you know, sailor's you know, laissez-passer documents uh, that allowed him to travel on it, except 
the documents were someone who actually, if you read the description, was nothing like him. So he was really, really worried. But you know, he had these close calls, and somebody who knew him saw him, but didn't turn him in, and he eventually made it and snuck through, found himself in New York City, discovered that New Netherland, the Dutch settled area around New York City, was an incredibly dangerous place to be a runaway slave, because the Dutch tradition of tolerance is morally neutral, right? Tolerance of difference, tolerance of slave catchers, tolerance of slavery, tolerance of abolitionists. And fortunately, though, he happened to bump into, by fortuitous circumstances, the, uh, the conductor of the Underground Railway, Mr. Ruggles, who managed to get him and then his uh, fiance, who was a, a free black woman in Baltimore, together, and then shipped them along to safety in the relative safety of New Bedford, Massachusetts, just up the road, where Frederick Douglass was working as a day laborer um, when he was suddenly discovered, rather by accident, by the Garrisonians, the big abolitionists in New England. Um, he stood up and spoke in a meeting and told something about his own life as an enslaved person who had just escaped. And he had an incredible story to tell, the Garrisonians realized, but also he was a staggeringly gifted orator. And they like grabbed him like, we need you. And they, you're not gonna be a day laborer, you're gonna be our star. And they took him and they made him their star speaker. They put him on the railway lines that were expanding all over the, uh, the northern tier of the country, sent him off as far as Ohio and Michigan and, and Indiana and all over the place giving multiple speeches a day. And this was at a time when this was the game, right? You ever wonder how ideas percolated and got around? Well, it was like a slow motion version of what happens today, right? Back then, the spoken word was key, right? Somebody would have access to the August Hall in your community, the, the, the high profile, high status place where a speaker would be invited. And if you were fortunate enough to be gave access to that stage, Everyone who was anybody and other people as well would come to that town because there wasn't a lot to do at night either and listen to the speech. And then you would go talk about it to your neighbors. But the local newspaper would also be there if it was an important speech and they would take down the entire speech. And then they would go at night and they would take out and put all their you know, letter press, all the little letters and put a symbol of the thing and put it on the thing you know, stamp on the thing and get out the newspaper with the entire speech's text in it. And then some of those newspapers would be distributed by the Boston Post writer down the post road and get to the next town. And the local newspaper, all the newspapers subscribed to each other, would get it and go, oh, that's an amazing speech. And they would take it get all their you know, letters out and put them out and put them in the thing. They, they just retweeted it, right? And they'd send it out, someone would go on a ship. And it would slowly, if it was really important, retweet, get a lot of likes across the country. And somebody would read it and say, this is a ridiculous speech, this is totally absurd. And they would take an excerpt of it, and they would publish it, and they'd put their own comment mocking it above, right? Retweet with comment. It worked a lot like Twitter, but in really slow motion. And eventually, the retweets would reach somebody who would be outraged and want to comment like William Gilmore Sims, say, in Charleston. And Charleston's most august stage would be opened up and William Gilmore Sims would come out to respond to Bancroft's nonsense in a great oration. Everyone in the town would come and the newspapers would retweet it back outwards. And that's how the intellectual life of the country would function. And the really important stuff, the important speeches, would then be published in book form and start circulating around. That was the name of the game. And the point of this is that Frederick Douglass had been put right in the center of the most powerful media kind of apparatus you could be in. And he, when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, he was so wanted, right? He even wrote, he ended up being a great writer. He wrote the story of his enslavement down in a best-selling book. He ended up with three biographies that were all bestsellers. But that meant that his, the people who had enslaved him knew who he was and where he was. And when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, which forced northern free states to enforce the capture of runaway slaves and send them back south, it was no longer safe to be in the US. So he went, with the help of friends, to Ireland and to the United Kingdom, where he went on an incredible year and a half long speaking tour there to rapt audiences in the thousands. And he spoke throughout all of these, uh, uh, his, his general message, the ultimate message of Douglas, in all of the incredible speeches he gave and in his writings and essays, was um, essentially the civic national narrative idea that Bancroft had put forward that what bonds us together isn't a shared bloodline or ethnicity or tribalism, but commitment to a shared set of ideals in the Declaration of Independence. But unlike Bancroft, who believed God had chosen the way, just sit back, America is destined and cannot fail, Douglas knew that America had failed, that America, it was aspirational ideas, that they were great ideals, but that America wasn't achieving them. He knew firsthand 
as an enslaved person and in the racism he encountered. But he didn't just speak for African Americans. He spoke in his speeches for whatever oppressed group was involved at any one time. He was, you know, in, he moved to Rochester, New York, and was good friends with Susan B. Anthony. He was one of the, uh, the few men on the stage at the Seneca uh, Women's Convention out in Seneca Falls, New York. He um, spoke out, you know, during the Chinese Exclusion Act for Chinese people. He spoke across England because he arrived in Ireland at the moment the potato blight, the potato famine hit, and was speaking to English audiences about what was being done in Ireland. Whatever groups uh, were being oppressed, he was arguing for, that the great mantle of the ideals that all people are uh, inherently equal as humans and should be granted those equality of opportunity was his ultimate speech. But realizing that we were flawed and that we had to fight for those things or it wouldn't happen. He was imploring basically white northerners to stand up for those ideals. And he went to Abraham Lincoln during the midst of the Civil War when Washington was surrounded on three sides and an umbilical cord of a fortified railroad line from Baltimore was the only link to the rest of the Union. An incredibly dangerous place for the most famous uh, fugitive slave in the entire country to be riding. He went there twice to go meet with Lincoln and implore him to do exactly that, which helped push Lincoln, Bancroft met with him too, by the way, to push Lincoln to finally commit to those ideals, which is not where we started during the Civil War, but at the Gettysburg Address is the moment where Lincoln stood on the ground with the bodies still out there in the fields around him to commit that the reason we were fighting this war was to enforce those ideas in the Declaration that they should not perish, right? That they were ideals that if you didn't fight for them would disappear. And in doing these things, Douglas articulated the American civic national narrative in the most amazing ways that have been done before or since, and whose language has inspired uh, many other speakers and speeches uh, since. But the counter-reaction came, and came rather quickly, because it said that the South you know, lost the war but won the peace, and the crowning victory for that was a, a rising to the presidency of one of their own, this man, Woodrow Wilson. Now we think of Wilson, right, as uh, the governor of New Jersey and the president of Princeton, right, an Ivy League college professor, but he was really the first deep southern president uh, in the nation's history. Uh, he was raised in Augusta, Georgia and, uh, during the Civil War and then in uh, Columbia, South Carolina after it had burnt, been burned by Sherman. Uh, and his father was the most famous and important intellectual of the uh, Confederate Presbyterian Church, famous for his own contribution from the lectern, a incredibly popular in the South speech, uh, showing that slavery was endorsed by God that had spread all over the place. This was his dad, who was like, you know, the most committed white supremacist you could imagine, and Woodrow Wilson in all his writings was totally committed to his dad and his dad's point of view. It carried through throughout his writings and his life. If you read his academic work, if you read his popular histories, and if you look at his policies and when he came in and was actually president. It was he who segregated the victorious federal union government uh, after the Civil War. It was he who was there um, and backed the first Hollywood blockbuster film at a critical moment, right? Birth of a Nation, remember that film? I mean, it's often forgotten. It was a technical triumph, but the story of the film is the heroism of the Ku Klux Klan and using a violent terrorist campaign to roll back the political emancipation of African Americans in the South. That's the story of the film. And it was in 1915 when it was released, right? First Hollywood, the first movie ever filmed in Hollywood, right? D.W. Griffith discovered this village outside of Los Angeles called Hollywood and started filming the film there and then you started establishing movies there. Instead of being a 15 minute film shown in Nickelodeons to working class people, it was the first film that was epic with zillions of actors on a giant screen that would be shown in the greatest opera houses and the greatest venues in every city, right? It was a complete change in the way movies were thought of. But this was the story of the movie. And it was controversial then as you might imagine now by lots of people and there were massive protests not unlike like Black Lives Matter protests, some of the first massive protests organized by African Americans to stop the film in cities like Los Angeles and Boston and New York, right? Because this is at a time period in 1915 when the Supreme Court had not yet ruled that artistic productions were protected speech under the First Amendment. So mayors and governors regularly censored plays and now motion pictures that were thought to be corrosive of public morals. And that's what the protesters wanted the mayors in these cities or the governors to do. And it ended up being uh, incredibly dangerous 
for the producers of the film because they'd spent you know, a quadrillion dollars creating this epic. And if they lost access to the major markets in Boston and New York, they would go bankrupt. And so they did a Hail Mary pass, right? D.W. Griffith's co-producer was the guy who wrote the book, The Klansman, upon which the movie was based, a guy named Thomas Dixon Jr., who was Woodrow Wilson's graduate school classmate and good buddy. And he went directly to the White House and said, you got to help us out here, Pre Mr. President. And he said, OK. And so he, he showed Birth of a Nation in the White House to his cabinet. And there were newspaper briefs the next morning going out. Imagine being a mayor in a city and you're whether or not you should census for public morals. And the White House has just shown it. And then Thomas Dixon Jr. the next day ran across you know, the street and ran across town with a letter of introduction to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice White of New Orleans, and said, hey, I've got this film. I'd love you to show it. And he said, I don't like films. He said, but it's about the Klan, and it's wonderful. He had been in the Klan. He thought this was great. So he rented out the most important ballroom in Washington, D.C., and showed it to the other Supreme Court justices and to all the leaders of Congress. In other words, this mo movement turned the film around, and it rose up to inspire the second Klan of the 1920s, right? The, the second clan organized itself around the premieres of this movie all over the South, actually riding down in their, you know, bringing their crosses to ride down and time the movie and to sign people up. It was an enormous effect. And, you, you know, you backed sort of the environment around the 1924 Immigration Act, which suddenly imposed race-based quotas explicitly in the act to preserve the Anglo-Saxon integrity of the country. In other words, what I'm saying is that the first of these two national narratives to actually win over intersectionally across the regional cultures and become dominant was unfortunately this one, the ethno-nationalist one, which is why it still has so much power, is it actually was able to dominate during the 1910s and 1920s. It wasn't just a minor accord through our history. The uh, final figure in this was a contemporary of Woodrow Wilson's. Uh, this is Frederick Jackson Turner, perhaps the most influential American historian ever with some of the most quoted papers. Uh, unlike the other people described in this book, he was not from the eastern seaboard of the United States. He was from uh, Portage, Wisconsin, which was then the frontier, the west of the country. And not surprisingly, being from that part of the country, he decided that none of these factors that the others were discussing was the key thing, that in fact, Amer that it's, it's the west and the middle west that shaped Americans and made them who they are. Yes, that indeed when finally Americans crossed over the Appalachian Mountains after the, uh, after the British defeat and started entering the, the grand watershed of the Mississippi Valley, that they were suddenly finally separated from the taint, the feudal taint of European civilization in the old world and would wander out into the Eden of the West and become who they truly should be, shaped by their natural environment, right, to become... Um, Americans dissolving their previous associations and become self-starters devoted to, uh, to Republican self-government and individual liberty and all of the rest. That, that was what shaped them. Because, remember, these are people who were little kids during the Civil War. When they're growing up and achieving their intellectual life in the 1880s and 1890s, the implications of Charles Darwin's uh, theories had come forward and started infiltrating social sciences, including the idea that, oh, if we think that species evolve that way, then maybe we think also that human societies evolve and adapt to the environmental characteristics. And that was the whole idea, that yes, you might have a Yankee settlement stream, and you might have a, you know, a settlement stream from New England, and a settlement stream from you know, the Quaker-founded uh, Delaware Valley, and ones from the uplands of the south settled by the Scots-Irish. But when they entered the Mississippi Valley, just like Darwin's finches, you know, had, you know, each one in different island had discovered a different environment and adapted to the environmental needs on that, his theory was that all of these different areas all encountered the same environment at the west, and all became homogeneously one. That was his frontier thesis put forward at the Chicago World's Fair and a new rendering of who we were supposed to be that took that civic national strain and substituted divine intervention for the latest Darwinian science and how all of this would work. That was his new dream and it was staggeringly influential. He gave this paper out uh, everyone kind of ignored it until he published an essay describing how it affected the next election in of course, the Atlantic, 
And then uh, it just took off from there, ended up being incorporated into the curriculum of the new public high schools opening across the country, integrated into textbooks starting in the 1910s. The textbook series is that would dominate. There's one textbook written by a guy named Muzzy that pulled in these theories that ended up being the dominant textbook that a majority of public high schools used for American history from the 1910s through to the early 1960s. In other words, this was the history received by most baby boomers in their, uh, in their education for years after the theory was written. It was drawn in and, of course, uh, you know, given fruition in uh, you know, the movies, uh, the westerns of like John Ford and in the, so, the whole idea that the West kind of formed America's character and the, the frontier experience uh, uh, devised and shaped uh, who we are. But the thing is, the, the irony of it all is that shortly after he released this thesis and the genie was going out into the world and everyone was seizing upon it and, and making it popular, Frederick Jackson Turner himself realized it was wrong. <laughs> right? He started looking. Like he, was, he was a demon researcher, terrible procrastinator. Right? He wrote in his whole career, like most famous American historian ever because of this one paper that got cited like 10 billion times, he only wrote in his lifetime one book Right? He was under contract for like 20, and editors begged him to finish, but he loved research, he loved teaching, he loved his graduate students. He would fill entire, you know, like, like the last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, when they take the Ark away, he would fill like entire warehouses with notes for books that he would never have time to finish, right? He was working away, he was researching and realizing he couldn't make the, num the numbers work. However, he looked with a new cartography at the way the different settlement streams entered the West, trying to show how they were becoming more alike he was discovering they weren't becoming more alike. They were stubborn, stubbornly remaining like the regions that they'd each left from, right? All the way up until, you know, here's the 1916 election between Woodrow Wilson and Charles Hughes, right? You can see that Yankee settlement strand is voting Republican in that era. You know, if you, you could just flip the colors now for 2008 or 2012, right? It's, it's the same map, the tectonic fissures, the parties have changed alignments and constituencies and values and regional orientations, but the map survives. But that was the consistent pattern he kept seeing, no matter what he looked at. And he, but he couldn't let go of the idea of environmental determinism, so he was stuck on it. You know, his final words before he died, after working on his final book, which is going to be on America and its sections, the idea that to truly understand the United States, you had to understand that we were a federation of regions with characteristics much like European nations. But he couldn't quite finish it because he was still glued to the idea that somehow environmental determinism was shaping it. So his final words on his deathbed were, Tell Max, the organizer of the Institute, who said, I'm sorry, I didn't finish my book. <laughs> so that was Turner. So unfortunately, by that time, the US had indeed embraced that cross-sectional myth of who Americans were and where they came from, and it was that ethno-nationalist one that Sims and Wilson had promoted, with Turner's frontier thesis hijacked, probably to Turner's surprise, as a vehicle for explaining the Anglo-Saxon cowboy's conquest of the West over the savage Indian tribes, right? Turner ignored the indigenous people altogether or put them in his extras, right? He was supposed to be an Eden that had no people in it, even though in Portage he would have known otherwise. And that carried forth in that, you know, a Midnight Magnolia's version of Southern life in those, uh, you know, cowboy and Indian television shows and Gone with the Wind and so on and so forth. But that ethno-nationalist triumph that I described that took hold in the 1910s and 20s was itself short-lived. The civic nationalist one dethroned it again in the middle of the 20th century. Mass conscription in both world wars produced multi-ethnic units and multi-racial armies whose members felt that they'd earned rights to full citizenship and consecrated them with blood sacrifices. African-American veterans of these wars would form the backbone of resistance that culminated in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, which challenged the apartheid system of the South. The Cold War itself compelled federal officials to support this movement at critical junctures. This was because the conflict with the Soviet Union had become in many respects a proxy war for hearts and minds of the non-white populations in what we, was then called the third world, the developing world. And the Soviets could active, uh, ac accurately and effectively tell these people, as in this Soviet propaganda poster, you know, that the United States didn't live up to any of those ideals. That in fact, if your ambassadors in your countries and diplomats were to travel from Washington in three directions, they would be denied access to beaches, to restrooms, 
to restaurants and hotels, even the hotels hosting conferences to which they as ambassador have been invited to. All true and it all had happened. They'll be treated as second class citizens, as racially inferior. All true. And this, in the context of the Cold War, Truman and Eisenhower and JFK and Lyndon Johnson realized could not stand. And so the federal government at key junctures was willing to intervene for national security reasons to assist the movement from below happening on the civil rights movement in the South. So the civil rights movement toppled Southern apartheid and challenged Northern racism. The feminist movement demanded social, professional, and sexual equality for a gender that comprised a majority of the population. Gays and lesbians fought the police and discriminatory ordinances. Elite colleges began partially dismantling their old boys' networks, and public universities rapidly expanded to increase educational opportunities. Congress passed a new immigration law in 1964 that repealed those ethno-national quotas, reopening America's gates to humanity at large. And a new generation of historians challenged the neo-Confederate narrative of American history that had dominated scholastic textbooks for half a century, while dispelling the innocence of the American colonization of a continent. And so, the civic national narrative returned to the fore. And for my generation, I'm a Gen Xer at least, it seemed it was permanent that that white supremacist model had, was on, had been toppled forever and would not rise again. We elected an African-American president after all, twice, right? But of course, ethno-nationalism hasn't been vanquished. And I believe it's essential for the United States' survival that it is, because it can't hold a diverse country together, but rather is a formula only for disaster and dissolution. And that wouldn't be good for us or for the rest of the world either. And on that cheerful note, I invite Jim up to, uh, to chat further. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You got one more? There you go. So I'm going to put this on. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Good. All right. So um, so you like, right? Right? That's, uh, <laughs> I can see you all at a distance. Yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, Colin a couple questions, but we really want this to be a conversation with all of you as well. Uh, so if you've got a question, we do have these microphones, but if you're more comfortable and you want uh, to just ask from your seat, raise your hand, and if we need to amplify it, I'll just repeat what the question was, uh, and we'll do it that way. Um, so Colin, um, we hinted, and we didn't hint, I just said it, uh, <laughs> that, you're, that you're going to do something about all of this. Uh, here uh, as, as part of the Pell Center. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that project, which we should note is still very much in its formative stage. We're, yeah. we're talking about aspirations. Right. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is one that we have, uh, that we're working on now. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what that project might turn out to be? Yeah, well, one of the um, essential crises that the United States is in now, at a time when, you're right, red states and blue states. My regional cultures I describe in American nations seem to agree on absolutely nothing, right? They're totally different policy environments, becoming more and more different information environments. The question is, you know, why do they stay together? Why America? Why should we all be involved in a united project? What is that united project? What is our story of who we are as a people? You know, who belongs? Where did we come from? Where are we going? All of that national narrative stuff that they were contemplating in the 1830s, we've lost that story, right? The ethno-national story is out there and has power. The competing story of who we are tied to the American experiment of those ideals in the Declaration of Independence of a liberal democracy, right? Small L, small D, the effort to create a society where humans can be universally as free as possible and the obligations in order to coordinate and make that society happen. We've lost that story, right? Rightly, during the 60s and 70s, the realization of all the people left out of the story, all the terrible things that had been done in contradistinction to our ideals were all probed by scholars and brought forward as they should, but we forgot afterwards to reassemble the corrected story above us, the overarching meta-narrative that can hold the peoples together, right? Because nations are abstractions. We need a compelling story for why we exist that inspire us to move forward and inspire us in a direction as to where we're going to go. So that's missing. The revived civic national story created and articulated in ways that can't, you know, aren't just deployed you know, to a university audience or in the Atlantic Monthly, but figuring out ways where you can talk about that 
to people who don't follow stuff closely. The people posters call the low information voters who aren't really paying attention to the news and stuff, but are getting all kinds of nonsense for free in their Facebook algorithms. How do you reach out and unite a peoples again? So that's a project in developing from our history and the building blocks that we have around us that go back into time, back to the Declaration and all of this history, how do you devise a revised civic national narrative? Well, that's the core of a project where you take that and you actually go out and test the messages as to how you effectively talk about that. Do the polling work, do the messaging work with the people who work in neurosciences and understand how people think about ideas and figure out how you talk about those things today in a compelling and meaningful way as part of the overarching effort to shore up our republic and shore us up as one peoples and one country with a revived purpose, right? And that's the work of uh, you know, a think tank like the Pell Center and a project which we envision uh, you know, putting forward that will take place here, one of the core things is developing and figuring out you know, exactly how to test and message that and make it available so that it can be deployed in civic education curricula and the way people talk about uh, their country and rally people around their ideals. So that's the general idea of something we call Nationhood Lab. And, and you know, expect to hear more about that in, in the coming months, and, and, and uh, we're, we're excited about it. You know, one of the things that intrigues me about your biography, and particularly in the context of these books, um, so Woodrow Wilson, apart from being just a flagrant racist, uh, was also the American president at the end of World War I, uh, whose approach to nationalism in Europe I had never viewed through the prism of American race until I read... Right. Union, um, can you t uh, put? A, and you, I should. We should note too that you reported from that part of the world right. uh, as part of your career as a journalist. Can you put into context how Wilson's view of race and identity and nationalities, born in the racism of the United States, manifests itself in his approach to the post-war settlement? In Europe. Right, into foreign policy, right? Because I thought of it the same way, right? I thought of Wilson as the, the tragic idealist who tried to bring peace to Europe, right? I was a East European and Balkan history major as an undergraduate. 1989 came along, it was my junior year abroad. I was in Budapest when communism collapsed and saw that all happen. I went back and spent like my entire you know, 20s and all the 1990s covering that region, the ethnic conflicts, the carpet bagging people coming in the collapse of the Soviet empire, efforts to devise new national stories for themselves to create liberal democracies where none had existed or hadn't existed since the 1930s, battles over historical memory, ethnic conflict, big lies to get people to do terrible things, much like Ukraine and Putin uh, today. All of that stuff was happening then, right? And in all of that, Woodrow Wilson was like, oh, that idealistic president who tried to bring ideas of self-determination to this region, and he failed because you know the Congress and the Senate wouldn't go along. But then you step back and you read all his letters and you start putting together who he was biographically and you realize, think about what it was, right? It was national self-determination for the former colonial subjects of the central powers in Europe. In other words, the white nations would get self-determination. What of Micronesia, the German colonies there? What of the German colonies in Africa and the Middle East and the Austrian uh, Empire's colonies? No, they were different mandates, right? Class A, B, and C mandates, right? With the Class C mandates of the Palauans and Marshallese and Micronesians as being ir you know, irreparably savage people would have to spend all of their lives under the tutelage of more masterful people. It was a apartheid racial structure from the beginning Beyond that, at Versailles, right, one of the victorious powers was Japan. And Japan came forward, there were the Covenant, right, mm -hmm. of the League of Nations with the 14 points. Japan came forward with the 15th point. It was that all of the uh, members of the League of Nations would repudiate racism and that all of the members of the League would be treated as equals when traveling in each other's countries, right? That was a complete threat to Woodrow Wilson South. Woodrow Wilson was chairing the key committee when the vote came up. It passed like, you know, eight to two. And Woodrow Wilson declared that it did not pass because it had to be unanimous, which was outrageous because all the votes up until then had not been unanimous, but he declared that it had to be unanimous because it was such an important vote. 
He also was reached out to William uh, Monroe Trotter, who had led uh, some of the, uh, the, the great protests against Birth of a Nation in Boston and elsewhere. He was one of the big civil rights figures of that time period. Had traveled, smuggling himself, because the US wouldn't give him an exit visa to go to Versailles, had smuggled himself working as a you know, kitchen steward on a ship to get to Versailles to go meet with Wilson uh, to talk about uh, making sure that there were equity and self-determination of peoples within the United States, refused to visit with him. Refused to visit a young uh, man from French Indochina who wanted to talk about the uh, self-determination for his own peoples. A guy who then worked under the uh, nom de guerre Ho Chi Minh leader to liberate his people from the French himself. So I'm saying there's, there was an entire structure of a structured and tiered hierarchical world, even within what we think of as those idealistic moments for Woodrow Wilson at Versailles. So you know, we've mentioned the series of conversations that we're having. And I remind folks, if you've got questions, raise your hand. I'll be happy to come to you. Uh, but we, I mentioned this, this, this uh, series of events and conversations we've been having with the League of Women Voters, in particular focused on the health of American democracy. So I, I, you haven't exactly beaten around the bush about it, but let's, let's sort of go head on at this. In your assessment, given what you've studied as a scholar, but also what you've lived as a journalist working in places that were emerging or failing and sometimes backsliding democracies, what's your assessment of American democracy today? Right, I'm extremely concerned, right? The hour is rather late. And I've been concerned for a while. I mean, I wrote a book that came out in early 2016 that I've been working on for two years, American Character. It's out there. It's kind of the, there's a trilogy of books, right? American Nations, Union, which I talked about tonight, and American Character, which came out in the middle, which said... Here's what we've been fighting over if we don't rewrite the relationship between the two as key aspects of freedom, individual liberty and the common good or the building of a free society. They have to be in equilibrium for a liberal democracy to work. And we've been off on the individual liberty side so far that the social contract is breaking and we're opening ourselves up to a breakdown of liberal democracy. I was writing this book like, you know, in 2015, came out in 2016. It's like, there's an iceberg ahead. We need to change course. <laughs> we might hit it in a few years. The book came out in like, you know, four weeks later, Donald Trump won the nomination. Like, nobody could pay attention to the book. It was like, everyone's running, are there enough lifeboats on the Titanic? You know, quick, run around. So I've been worried about it for quite some time. And the stuff that I, you know, saw in as Yugoslavia was collapsing and breaking down, as you saw tyrants like you know, Viktor Orban. When I was there in 1989, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, um, you know, was, he was the young you know, star, you know, young Democrat and leading a movement of young people not tainted by communism who were gonna lead the country into a new wonderful liberal future, right? And you could see him transform like Dorian Gray over time. All those, the language, the, the, the way that people would be othered and targeted and you devise a, a group of people who are the real Hungarians, right? Or the real Poles, the real Americans, and somehow those people who might be citizens somehow aren't and shouldn't have, I mean, all of this playbook is very familiar to anyone who's lived in a society, you know, backsliding out of democracy or consolidating an authoritarian society. All the characteristics have been developing over the past five years in the US in an extremely troubling way. And yeah, I don't think people quite realize how big the stakes are and that commitment not a partisan commitment, but a commitment to small d democracy and to that American experiment and those values in the declaration, you know, it's imperiled and people need to fight for it, just like Frederick Douglass said they did. It's not, Bancroft was wrong, it doesn't just happen by itself, right? We're not just chosen and fated because we're Americans to succeed, right? We can fail if we don't fight for those ideals and I think that's one of the key things that concerns me is you know, people are starting to wake up to it. January 6th was a major moment for that, but still, you know, in this information environment we're in, even enormous events like that somehow seem to kind of get forgotten and disappear into the static after a while. So we've got some questions, so we're going to start here with Louisa. Yes, please. Responsibility, which is really to follow the laws, and it just seems like there's 
a real lack. So I think you, I love what you're saying is bringing everybody together to one story, but it just seems like we're so we're fractionated, and we, the civil discourse is difficult. So I'm curious. Yeah. So just so in case folks didn't actually hear all of that, I'm going to do my best to paraphrase here. Uh, but uh, how can we have a meaningful and productive civil discourse in an era that is filled with lies and disrespect? It's not going to be easy, right? We're, we're not actually going to be able to have like a, you know, any time in the near future, have everybody have a kumbaya moment. We're all going to cooperate and, and talk nicely with each other. It's going to be you know, a bare knuckles struggle for those who want to defend the American experiment against those who really don't right now. You know, maybe they've reached there through no fault of their own eventually, but at some moment you have to say, I am against authoritarianism and you know, an ethno-nationalist definition to this country, or you're not. And the people who are against it are a super majority in the country. They're just not awoken to it, right? It's not, you're not gonna win everybody over in any society and anything, but in this polarized age, you know, it's gonna be a super majority fighting against a, a very much disagreeing minority that is committed to, you know, not committed to liberalism and to democracy, small l, small d, uh, but to an authoritarian answer. That's true in any society, but we're in a very difficult position now, right? So I don't see it as universal, but it's the fact that you know, the two-thirds, three-quarters of the country that stands for those things across parties, you know, needs to wake up and stand up on those issues together. This is as much a political challenge as it is anything else. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, a democracy and a liberal democracy is, requires an engaged Republican citizenry, right? We're, in the end, we're sort of sovereign, so it requires that it's a political act to keep it going and to keep it propped up, right? David. <clears throat> so, um, I was interested by your comment about liberal Wilson's father. Yeah. What struck me looking at your map was I'd love to know your mm. thoughts on the influence of religions in those different nation states. And as you talk about mm. Russia right now, you know, the Russian Orthodox mm. versus Ukraine Orthodox, which is yeah. the prosperity, evangelism. <clears throat> So yeah. the, the question is, uh, how does religion uh, affect uh, those, those, those American nations? Yeah, I mean, the, the deep, you know, religious traditions are one of the more powerful forces that affect cultures and their values and stuff. And the, you know, the, the founding, you know, the, the ideas of American nations fall from the cultural geographer Wilbur Zielinski's doctrine of first effect settlement. He was asking the question, okay, when people come and colonize a place that had never been colonized before, or push or wipe out the people who were there and create a new society, how does culture get passed along from the beginning point? And his theory was, which I think is correct, is that the first group of people who create a self-perpetuating society, the characteristics of that group will have an overwhelmingly outsized effect on the future trajectory and values and characteristics of that society, then even if their numbers were very small and the numbers of people who came later were very large because they kind of format the hard drive. They set down the ideas and the, you know, uh, you know, who we are, what we celebrate, what the good life is and all those things. And religion's very much a part of it. And so you get in broad terms, the differences between the regional cultures, that's one aspect, right? Why is Yankeedom the way it is? I mean, you didn't have to be a Puritan or from the Congregationalist or a Unitarian. If you live in New England, you're part of a world that the Puritans affected. The idea, the Puritans thought they were covenanted people like the Hebrews, right? God had said, go forth and do this thing as a group. And if you mess up, you'll all be punished as a group, right? You, you need to create a perfect society and you better watch each other because Calvin says, you know, people are inherently wicked, right? If you don't watch out for people, they're gonna go off into sinful ways. The people are out there, you know, we have nucleated settlements, right? Little nucleated farms surrounded by fields. But if people go off in the forest, my gosh, you can't keep track of them. They're hanging out with the indigenous people. You know, they're not good Puritans. Maybe they're witches, right? It's, it's a world of like, you're worried that the, so it's a communal project, right? With a moral purpose, a utopian project. We can make the world better and we ought to in the here and now, right? You gotta keep track of people, the danger to the freedom of the community will come from one of the individuals in the community rising up and becoming a tyrant over us. We need to protect the community from that. Thus, you don't give counties any power in New England, right? Maybe you don't even have counties, right? Down in the South, counties are, are the uh, all-powerful government. You have town meetings and little, every town is a republic unto itself. The Puritan church, you know, each of the congregations 
was independently organized and run so that you wouldn't have any higher powers over it, right? It's a communitarian enterprise around utopian principles. And when you fast forward to the great awakenings out on the frontier after the revolution was a flourishing of, of religions forming, a lot of the religions that formed on the Yankee frontier in the burnt over district of New York had a lot of those same characteristics, right? And Seventh day Adventists and you know, the Mormons are a great example, right? Almost all New Englanders, right? The Smiths were from Vermont, they all formed out there and, and there's, right, just like the Puritans, right? They have a task to create a more perfect society as per our understanding and, and background, and we're gonna go deploy it right now. You know, we get pushed out into Utah, but we're actually gonna create modeling the, you know, the Holy Land, and here's the Sea of Galilee, and here's a saltwater lake, and we're gonna put our Jerusalem right there and call it Salt Lake City. I mean, it's a utopian project. Okay, then you go to somewhere like Greater Appalachia, right, where the religious traditions were we're uh, forming out the Presbyterian Church and going out into the frontier, and the idea was, you know, right, Scots Irish were about individual liberty and personal autonomy, and a distrust of institutions and frameworks and government, right? You had to fend for yourself, protect your kith and kin yourself, right? Where are peoples who are out on the lowlands of Scotland and in Ulster, and government meant, you know, a bunch of, you know, soldiers with, you know, lances who are gonna mow down your family, you gotta protect your family and stuff. It's all about you protecting it. In that religion, right, it was about, you know, this world is wicked, don't worry about it. In general, the religions that formed there were about your personal connection with the creator, the divine, right? And your salvation in the next world, don't worry about this one. And, your, you know, the, the religions that formed in the, you know, the, the, the great, um, you know, uh, religious revivals and awakenings out there, often you have a charismatic guy just down the road, another farmer who comes out and speaks and inspires people and isn't trained in the book or anything. You follow them. It's like one of your neighbors, right? Individualistic, egalitarian, and about the hereafter, right? So that has all kinds of policy implications right there, right? In those two frameworks, individual liberty and autonomy, community utopianism. Is this world depraved or can you make a better world now? Is that encoded into the regional cultures? Your question about Ukraine and Russia, though, there's a whole other thing, right? Orthodox churches, right? There were, they, the idea in Byzantium became that the churches were under the emperor. And in Rome, the, you know, the Rome collapsed and the, you know, the, the Pope was the last person standing, so it was reversed. But that meant when the empire collapsed into a Bulgaria and a Serbia and a Ukraine, each one had a patriarch who each was under the king of those places. And so there ended up being a chessboard battle. And there's been an enormous battle between the titular head of the entire Orthodox Christian world, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, he's still there, Right? There's still a, a patriarchate in Istanbul. He's written into the, uh, into the Turkish constitution. He has no power. He's got eight followers, like 70-year-old you know, <laughs> you know, Greek-speaking you know, speaking guys in Istanbul. But in theory, he's the first among equals in the great boardroom of Byzantium. And they still think Byzantium. I've spent a number of weeks with the leaders of this thing. And the battle with the Russian patriarch, right? In the communist world, right, they're subjected to the king. All of those patriarchates became sub, uh, subjects of the secret services in the communist period. They were KGB agents, in effect, right, working for the state. And so the battle between the Russian Orthodox patriarchs and the ecumenical patriarch, moral authority and no earthly power versus this guy with not that much moral authority and staggeringly earthly power. And <laughs> Ukraine has been a chess match on the board for the past 15 years that you're now seeing coming to fruition. But it's not so much like values differences between the two churches. It's a genuine Byzantine chessboard power struggle um, over the great power mappage of Byzantium, which you know, isn't dead yet, right? It's still there. <laughs> I know we're gonna come here, but we got a question here first. Well, I had uh, two questions. Uh, yes, please. So first was uh, regarding the current uh, climate that we have, you see the debate for additional imports from Russia, and then the second one was And by institutions, do you mean like specifically higher education ones or all of them? Universities, high schools, yeah. I mean, the, the answer you're... Uh, on, oh, you so, um, yeah, are we, uh, are we doing enough in our institutions, especially our educational institutions, to impart uh, civic national knowledge of our history and stuff in order to 
keep us united as a peoples, and given all of the tragic implications of slavery and all the other things, is it possible to create a narrative of uh, national unity that would function? Both excellent questions. I mean, my feeling is in the status quo now, no, our institutions are not succeeding in that. And part of it is like, you know, we by design, unlike Europe, we don't have a ministry of culture, right? In, you know, in France, you'd have a ministry of culture and they will devise the curriculum and this is what the French state is and this is our history and here all the, uh, you know, the ministry of education will take these textbooks and send it out through all the schools which are run by the ministry of education. We don't have that, right? We have local control by school boards of citizens in every single place who don't agree on any of these things and the biggest places like Texas and California can have veto power in the market over what's in a history textbook because they're so big and they're such a large portion of the, of the, uh, the school market. So you can't send down one set, especially about history, which is always a fraught subject, right? So no, we don't succeed. People come out of the environment of public schools, I think with less, and, because we're more polarized, there are fewer and fewer things we agree on and therefore fewer and fewer things you can safely talk about in a public school curriculum, right? So that makes it much more difficult. At the university level, I mean, I'm not in your, in, you know, university classes all the time, but my impression is it's probably pretty good, but I'm not sure that every institution, by the time you're an undergrad, they're expecting, you know, your basic US civics, right? I don't think there's usually a requirement that you take, you know, US history and civics as an undergrad. You know, maybe they would need to be coming up if we can't feel that everyone's kind of gotten their background on it. Can you create a national story despite the words? Yeah, absolutely, I think so. I mean, it's, it's that Frederick Douglassing path, right? It's, you know, any, you know, narratives are stories that inspire people and change the world. And a really good story, like a really good movie, it isn't just like, you know, a Barney episode, which, you know, everything's great and continues to be great. And, you know, there's no narrative arc to that, right? The little kids love it, but it drives the rest of us crazy. <laughs> the incredible story, right? That, that's Bancroft's arc, right? Everything's great, right? But the, in reality, right, it's the, it's the tension, it's the tragedies, the times we failed and somehow heroically pulled it back up. And it, it's all of those tribulations and failures that make an incredible and heroic story that you can put together, that reveals, acknowledges all of the failures in the process to inspire towards these ideals, right? I mean, you can make a much more powerful story out of a flawed story than out of a, one that everyone will recognize as propaganda immediately because it's so flat, right? So yes, I think, I think you can, and in fact, you can turn it to your advantage as a storyteller uh, by actually recognizing those things and pulling them into the story. But fixating on the ideals, because if you're gonna say, be nihilistic and say, well, we failed in all those things, so therefore we'll never reach our ideals, what's your plan B, right? <laughs> what do you got, right? So you better go for this, because this is, you know, there, there is no plan B, really. Uh, are, you the, are you the first person to liken George Bancroft to Barney? Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> I, yeah. I think history was made here tonight. <laughs> right. We had a question here. And then we have politicians who, or I should say, supposed leaders, that are not really being responsible, but more into it for power. So how do we bring this other generation up to be aware of what's going on, to have different experiences, so that they can put that in their quiver? Yeah. So just frame that question for everybody. Yeah. Uh Essentially, um, how do you bring the next generation to be aware of all these things given the fractured environment they're growing up with and especially the sort of culture of the internet and screens and you know, my kids are six and 11 and you know, especially the pandemic, my gosh, you know, we lost the battle for the nine year olds with the screens, right? The only way they could access their friends or the outside world for months was like through the screens. They figured out how to talk to each other and play you know, Minecraft together in real time and build boards and start coding worlds and you know, that, that's how they interact now and it's kind of, irreversible, but you know, I guess I gotta just run with it, right? It's one of those changes. But in general terms, I mean, there, there's a lot of challenges that my kid's generation and, and the, the people 
10, 15, 20 years older than them are all experiencing, right? But in general, I have optimism with the next generations because they seem, you know, the information environment that they've all grown up with, millennials on down, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm, you know, I remember before the internet. But for those generations, you know, their sort of savviness and understanding of the world and, you know, ability, cynicism about information and all that kind of stuff is a lot more sophisticated than older generations were. And, you know, they seem to, as a generation, have a pretty, uh, you know, a generational idea that things are wrong and they want them fixed. Um, which, you know, my Gen X and generation, right, the baby boomers said, you know, you're, you're puny in numbers, you know, we're large in numbers and control everything, you know, sit back, we got this, right? So <laughs> we just set a count, okay, right, right? But the, the new generations are not like that, so, you know, a lot of the, you know, heavy lifting is going to be in the younger generations, but I kind of have, you know, faith in them um, that they're going to carry us forward. You're an optimist, I love that. I know, so speaking of that younger generation that is uh, online, uh, Aaron Barry has been monitoring the social media because this has been live streamed tonight. So Aaron, do you have some questions for us? I do, I do. So we have a question from Mark Dwyer who asks, are, given our fractured media landscape in the United States, are you optimistic about our ability to create a unifying message about our nationhood for America? It's much harder now, right? You know, it was much easier back in the time in the 1830s when they had the 19th century internet, right? You have a few stages and people didn't have a lot of competing media environment. It was much quieter. Now everyone's fractured, right? Everybody's getting their personalized stream of reality through social media, often mediated by an algorithm that other people can pay to decide what you're actually seeing and all the rest, right? That's a much more difficult proposition. But can you? Yeah, of course you can. I mean, look at what's done on, on the bad side of things, right? Critical race theory, nobody had ever heard of. And then like six weeks later, it's changing gubernatorial elections, right? <laughs> that was a, you know, somebody created a strategy to make that happen, to take a random thing. You know, let's have people take horse dewormers instead of getting vaccinated for free. Yeah, right? I mean, you can almost see two people in a Macedonian troll farm like, you know, high-fiving. High we did it, right? You, know, you win the bet, right? You can do that, right? And so you can do that, you know, for good purposes too. It's possible, and there's people out there who know how to do it. The tools are much more complicated, but it's not like an idea can't be propelled out there and reach large numbers of people. It's a lot more complicated. I personally don't have the technical knowledge, but I see how it is done, especially by nefarious actors, and it's, yeah, it's possible to break through all of those things. But you know, people need to think about the strategy and how the world actually is out there and how media is consumed and start re-triggering their strategies as to how you talk about things and where you do it and through what medium um, to, to access everybody. And, and I think that what you and I connected on when we first started talking about what we would do at the Pell Center was that it has to be done. This, this is something that if we just follow the, the path that we're on currently, it's not going to end well. No. So, did you have more? That's it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Well, folks, uh, we are at the point where we want to say thank you to our speaker, uh, Colin Word. Thank you, Colin, so much for uh, being with us. Me, yeah. Super. Thank you. Colin's books are for sale out in the lobby. If you're interested, I'm sure he'd be happy to sign one for you. Uh, but thank all of you for being part of this series this year. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters. We think we're going to have something this summer. Stay tuned, check your emails, but if not, we'll see you in the fall. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.